2021 uh, event from five different uh, continents. Uh, I think we have a, around uh, 70 uh, guests and uh, we're going to be recording this, this particular uh, event. So uh, ju ju just some quick points just to the starters off. We're going to record the session. Uh, and we will send a copy of the recording link in, in due course after we've edited that. Um, and you can also receive a copy of the uh, slides uh, if you would like those as well. Um, th th this is a, a, an open event. Uh, please do mute your line. Um, uh, you can use a chat function if you wish to raise any questions. Uh, I think the, the agenda is quite packed. We've allowed for a Q&A session at the very end of the workshop if there's time to take questions in between we'll do that Deanne's going to moderate and see if there's any questions there that we can squeeze in uh, after each uh, each slot as well uh, and if you would like a one-to-one -one session afterwards then we'd be delighted to organize that together with our partners uh, today as well so once again thank you very much uh, for joining in um, we've broken the session into two parts, a, a first half where we're going to uh, basically look at some of the industry trends in 2021. Um, I'm then going to uh, come back in and do a slot around new revenue um, areas that the ATM operators can take a look at. Um, we've then got uh, Steve Gildy from Paragon, who's going to be talking about automation tools um, and how to virtualize your ATM environments. They've, they've seen a massive growth in demand for their products and services in the last year. Um, and then uh, Dion Van Bouillon from Stanchion will talk about augmentation, skills augmentation and proactive uh, monitoring. We'll then take a very short break. Uh, and in the second half, uh, Michael Hartman from NCR will talk about the virtualization of the ATM switch and some changes that NCR uh, have made. Um, we might be hearing about those publicly for the first time, I think, on today's event, which is quite exciting. And then Roland Allen from Futurex will talk about HSM security in the cloud, which matches with the theme of virtualized environments. Uh, and then we've got an allowance at the end of that for uh, Q&A, uh, which we'll take as well. So very much the goals for today is to take a look at um, things that can help you in your business in 2021 and beyond, um, given the uh, past 15 months that, that we've we've all been through. So to kick us off on our very first uh, topic today, I'd like to welcome Andrew Dean, man uh, Managing Director of Calio and Exco member at the ATM Industry Association. So. Uh, Andrew, would you like to uh, take control of the screen? Yes, Norman, thank you. And thanks for the invite and the opportunity to share. I'm just going to share my presentation quickly. There we go. Uh, Norman, everything OK? You can see fine on your side? You can, yes. Thank you very All good. much. OK. Yeah, and again, thanks very much to Sanction for the opportunity. I think um, Today is just to, from my side, just to give um, some feedback on broader trends in the industry and what we're seeing, and then also to talk a bit about the response from uh, ATMIA, the ATM Industry Association. Um, I have worked closely with them, and as Norman mentioned, I serve on their uh, consultant EXCO team as well. Um, and, and Mike Lee, that many of you might know, uh, we've obviously been chatting recently and he's you know, keeping me up to date with, with what the industry association is doing as, as their response. So, first of all, just to talk through some uh, of the broader trends that we're seeing in the industry. So, needless to say, uh, there's been a, a huge impact last year on volumes. Um, the number of visits to ATMs have decreased substantially. Um, on the other side, interestingly, the withdrawal, average withdrawal values have been increasing, um, which a lot of people suspected at the beginning, you know, was about, about hoarding cash and keeping your, your assets safe. So, um, but, but of course, the, the volumes have reduced substantially. Um, and 
I think this was a link survey that was done um, in March 2020 when the question was asked, will COVID affect your use of cash? 77% of respondents said no. When in March 2021, 78% of respondents said yes. The uh, COVID is definitely going to impact uh, the use of cash. So uh, we are well aware of the broad trend and the acceleration of digitization uh, that COVID has has uh, pushed forward. Uh, and of course, the impact on that of people using more remote or mobile channels um, and digital channels to, to do financial transactions. Um, at the same time, that's led to a, a drop in, of course, profitability and a lot of operators and financial institutions have re reduced their the ATM footprint and um, a, a further pressure on margins and operational costs for, for managing uh, our ATM fleets uh, and services uh, because of, of less revenue coming in, whether it's on interchange or whether on value added services or on surcharge fees where, where applicable in, in certain territories. The, the graph there just shows the uh, feedback from Link in terms of you know using the UK United Kingdom as an example, uh, the ATM network. Um, I'm sure uh, across different regions we'd be seeing we'd be seeing similar graphs, uh, but you can see the volume of transactions in 2019. Uh, the the obvious drop when um, COVID hit in last year, the gradual uptake um, in. In, if you go have a look at the, the link statistics and, and you'll find this from other uh, switch operators and, and network operators and, and central banks, uh, they do go into more detail around the various announcements in the UK and, and how they impacted the, the trends within this broader graph. So, so quite interesting to see the, the obvious response as, as lockdowns are, 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 are instituted and then relaxed again. So, um, although everyone, you know, generally, if you if you're reading opinion pieces and you're seeing the the popular speak um, online, everybody's saying, you know, cash is dying and everything's moving to digital. Um, and I've worked with the ATM Industry Association quite a long time. Uh, we've also been involved in quite a bit of research on, you know, cash and circulation trends. And of course, it's it, there's not one answer, uh, depending on uh, developed markets versus emerging markets. There's, there's of course, a, a big difference um, around cash usage, of course, especially for low value transactions, um, which is impacted a lot about uh, around, or, or at least impacted by uh, access to cash or and access to, to financial inclusion. So, you know, in certain countries, as the unbanked are becoming banked, uh, often when it's a more traditional banking environment, you're finding, you know, the cards are getting issued. People are starting to use whether it's government sponsored uh, or, or through central financial inclusion drives. People are starting, you know, to to use uh, um, ATM cards and cash uh, that weren't included in the financial uh, 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 services before. So. India, for example, experienced a 65% growth on, on 2019 cash withdrawal values. Um, and um, the answer, you know, around both cash in circulation and withdrawal volumes uh, differs region by region and, and country by country. Um, so, so yes, definitely a broader trend, you know, towards digital, digital channels. But I think for all of us involved in the industry, important to take note of, of what's happening on a on a country by country basis, and then importantly, a, a urban versus rural. You know, what are the trends in, on both the urban and a rural footprint? Um, even before COVID, we were seeing a, a, you know, a big increase in, in contactless ATMs, uh, you know, whether it's pre-staging or whether it's uh, you know, through a mobile app or a USSD or SMS functionality, NFC or QR, you know, all the various different types of of uh, interaction methods with, with contactless, but definitely a growth, and and of course the the hygiene factors and the 
uh, consumer concerns or end user concerns uh, further driving the the push for for contactless ATMs. Um, cash deposits and recycling again a trend that was being pushed pre pre COVID days um, and uh, but uh, further you know uh, push for cash deposit taking ATMs throughout the markets and 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 that trend still still growing. Um, similarly, uh, we've been hearing about branch transformation for a long time, self-service, um, and again, the, the digitization trend and the, the need for remote and, and distance um, operations further pushing the incentive for, for operators, IADs, banks, and others to, to enhance the interactive services and the uh, personalization um, functionalities um, at, at the device. And then with all the hype around crypto, uh, a lot of you know talk and, and drive for support for uh, um, cryptocurrencies uh, at the ATM. So those are you know, some of the broad trends that I'm sure many of us are aware of across, across the industry. Um, and that really sets the tone for how uh, we need to look at, you know, how do we respond and, and what do we do? Um, a, a lot of these kind of drivers around, you know, how we need to respond to these challenges um, have, have been around um, and the pressure is just higher now because of the drop in volumes. So we're, we're seeing in, in, in financial institutions and IADs just a, a higher sense of urgency around driving these initiatives uh, that were on the radar um, uh, pre-COVID anyway. So, of course, the, the one opportunity is to increase the range of functionalities and the, and the customer experience and, and needless to say the revenue um, um, at the ATM, you know, um, whether that's, um, you know, currency conversion or, or other services that are offered that, that can enhance revenue. Um, and the you know teller-based services or other um, uh, uh, user-based services that, that can be offered at the at the ATM, um, um, big pressure to to look at all those functionalities that are that are available and and ask are they in place and and where can we monetize them and what other revenue can we be generating. On, on the other side, or on the flip side, at least, to reduce the cost and complexity. Uh, lots of speak about cloud migration and um, another driver towards reducing cost and complexi complexity is, you know, collaboration in the industry, working towards universal industry standards. Again, as a response to, to drive or to mitigate or to counter uh, the impact of the uh, the pressure on 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 volumes and and profitability thresholds. Mm. Banks considering a lot of outsourcing, you know, looking at shared infrastructure and resources, whether that's white white labeling ATM or ATM halls, which are white labeled, or more sharing of ATM uh, uh, in, uh, network infrastructure. Um, as well as improving our ability to do analytics around uh, what's happening from both uh, availability and a uh, response and a uh, user experience level. And then on the supply side, you know, seeing market consolidation, I think especially in the in the IAD environment, um, uh, certain organizations making a lot of acquisitions and consolidation um, on that side of it to again, improve economies of scale. So you know, just a quick overview of some of the responses that we are seeing from, from the industry. Um, the ATM Industry Association, uh, you know, just to, to introduce them, they are a global and not-for-profit uh, industry association. Um, and um, they've been really, you know, forward-looking around what do we need to do to future-proof uh, the ATM, you know, recognizing that, you know, remote and mobile channels are, are the drivers for in future and that being able to be, work cross-channel is going to be essential for the survival of the, 
of the ATM. So, um, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, in, in certain economies, uh, the ATM and access to cash uh, and financial inclusion still being, still being very strong. So uh, what they did was a couple of years ago, I think it was around 2017, 2018, they launched the Consortium for Next Gen ATMs, um, which was a, um, a, a, a industry uh, initiative uh, involving ATM manufacturers, IADs, uh, banks, um, and other players within the ATM sector to uh, look at creating a, a a standardized model for a um, API uh, um, um, architecture and and standards uh, for for the for the environment. And I'll go a bit more into that quickly. Um, I have got a video, but I'm watching time, so I'll probably just do a bit of an explainer around the architecture blueprint. But um, about 400 companies that are part of that. Um, uh, ATM um, uh, next gen ATM consortium at this at this at this stage, um, and as I mentioned, you know most of the large manufacturers and 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 banks and and IADs. So some of the things that they produced is a a architecture blueprint. I'll I'll show you that quickly. It's it's very busy. Uh, it is available, and and uh, we are able to send more information on there to you as a follow up. Uh, then business value propositions to look at. You know, from a uh, from an operator perspective, or from a bank or an IAD perspective, is you know what are the the benefits for uh, for these the standard approach to to next gen ATMs, as well as a detailed business toolkit uh, that they built, which is uh, a, a financial business case toolkit that that ATMIA has developed together with with all its um, with all its members. Yes. So, very much a, a member-driven um, initiative um, uh, coordinated by ATMIA. So if we can just check that everybody's uh, mics are muted, thank you. And also implementation guide uh, for operators and, and banks, and also a process for self-certification um, on the um, on the next-gen uh, uh, API app model. So um, those are all available resources um, from the industry association just to give you a sense of some of the other things that that they have produced um, a, a user interface and metrics best practice one of the key streams within the next gen atm consortium is the focus on customer experience um, and 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 driving um, you know uh, the ability for or the um, uh, receptiveness around customer-owned devices and accepting that customer-owned devices and the interaction with that at the ATM is going to be key in the future. Uh, recently, uh, ATMI also published a, a position paper on uh, promoting the widespread adoption of a universal cash deposit system and standards for ATM networks worldwide. So cash in and cash out um, um, across any network. Um, and again, all initi initiatives to further support uh, standardization and interoperability, uh, uh, which we know uh, is going to be uh, necessary and important for uh, improving uh, the economies of scale within uh, the ATM um, industry. And then I also mentioned earlier about cryptocurrency, and uh, they've recently launched a cryptocurrency ATM deploy this forum. So I just wanted to share some of that with you to get a sense or to, to give a sense of the uh, initiatives that uh, ATAMIA has has launched in, in response to some of the trends in the industry. Uh, this is an overview of the uh, next gen ATM architecture blueprint. Um, I think we will be sharing these presentations afterwards so you can see over there there's also a link to the YouTube explainer video. It's a very really short video, um, but I'm not going to I'm not going to share that now just for the the sake of time. Um, but as you can see, there's a, a endpoint devices layer, there's an app service layer, and there's an infrastructure layer. And then um, the uh, the the architecture blueprint makes provision for 
interfaces and components which are both provider agnostic and provider specific or deployer or appliance uh, and addresses all those those layers of appliance deployer proprietary and standards um, you can see the legend on the on the bottom right um, if you look at on the on the left hand side where it shows infrastructure management your hardware your your os layer and your kernel layer you see some of those those capabilities there around api management and infrastructure management security is is where i really think the consortium is seeing that there could be a lot of you know uh, uh, knowledge sharing and and sharing of resources and um you know creating that as a, a standard approach that will will drive you know further efficiencies into into the various layers of, of architecture within the, the within the ATM environment. Um, so quickly, some of the business value propositions I mentioned to you. There's also a detailed business case toolkit that that they produced. Uh, but uh, you know, some of the drivers for for what they see as the benefits is providing a range of community functionality and needs. Um, Standardizing key architectural components to reduce the total cost of ownership, of course, then driving profitability through the through the through the the lower total cost of ownership, um, providing or creating a basis for more flexibility to to adapt and operate in different environments and different configurations, and and then a standardized approach also allowing for for more flexible approaches to outsourcing and, and new partnerships and uh, and also a standard approach um, and a collective uh, input into the security of the ecosystem uh, and then hopefully you know reducing the collective cost um, of of risk and fraud mitigation in closing from my side some of the resources that that are available uh, these are publicly available resources. Um, there's a quick scan white paper um, on, on NextGen ATM, quite a good place to start. There's the more detailed business toolkit and matrix, uh, which identifies 44 specific aspects of, of the NextGen ATM approach that can reduce your costs and, your, and increase your revenue. Um, and of course, the other big driver there is your brand value. Um, then an implementation guide to start covering both functional and technical uh, specifications and, and certification, um, and, and a, a, which provides a framework for development, testing, and certification of, of software, as well as a self-certification process, um, which, uh, which allows for a, a API assessment you know, of the of our components. Um, so those really are some of the resources that have been made available. Uh, again, I know this this discussion this often is is you know is largely around you know what are the trends and what do we need to do to 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 focus on the the operational support elements. And I think a lot of what ATMI is doing is trying to actually for all of us will will lower the ongoing operational costs, uh, increase. Uh, user experience and 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 drive other business outcomes that we are all interested in as as players in the in the ATM ecosystem. And then lastly, I've, I've given two links there for people that might be interested in joining ATMIA, or uh, um, Mike Lee, uh, who's the CEO of ATMIA. Uh, you could just email him for anybody that that would be, is interested in in joining that. Next Gen ATM Consortium. I don't think there's there's any fee involved in, in joining it, and the more people involved in that, the better. So Norman, thanks very much again for the opportunity, and, and thanks, and back over to you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, so, perfect. So I'm, I'm Norman Frankel. I'm one of five regional managing directors at Stanchion. The uh, geography that, that I look after is Europe and the UK. Uh, and what I'm going to be really talking about is closing the revenue gap. So as uh, Andrew talked about, uh, there are a number of challenges, but there are also a number of new uh, aspects that are coming into the ATM industry and the kiosk industry. Uh, and I'm really going to be talking about uh, these, these new opportunities and some of the mega trends. 
Just a very quick introduction to Stanchion. Um, we're generally known as the organization that's able to solve complex payment problems. Uh, we've been in business for 20 years. Uh, we, we're spread across five different continents, six different offices, um, and around 100 different employees. And we traditionally work with banks, retail, processors, fintech, uh, and IT. Um, and really, our, our core is, is really solving your payment application problems. Um, so I just pulled up a slide from Accenture. We're going to be sending the, uh, the, the slides out. But the, one of the really big trends that's taking place right now is the generational shift. So with, with Generational Z and, and with uh, the younger millennial generation, there's a mega trend that's driving virtually everything else that's taking place. And this has now reached network effect levels. Uh, and what that's doing is it's changing the way that people are demanding and using payment services. And this is having uh, a partial impact uh, on the industry. So we're, we're seeing a uh, huge, huge demand for person to person payments, uh, even sharing their, their payment experiences on social media. Customer experience is a, a prime differentiator for, for those offering services. Value added services are, are key. Uh, the whole use of mobile device is, uh, is, is, is ever prevalent, uh, particularly within this, this group. Uh, and that, that's driving uh, new, new needs for security and tokenization type services. One of the really interesting things about this new generation uh, group as a community is they, they want instant gratification. They want more personalized experience uh, within their, their payment process. Um, and, and they tend to do everything on the mobile device. Uh, and this, this is driving significant changes. And we're going to be coming back to that. And I'll give you a demo, a live demo of a solution that, that you could use as ATM processors to drive new income streams uh, within there. So within this digital disruption race, uh, agility is being rewarded uh, and inaction is being punished. Andrew touched on a few uh, trends. I'm just going to draw some of these out as well. Um, we're seeing the, the, the rapid contactless shift take place. Uh, this has really been aided by increased CVM limits. Uh, and the UK, for example, is considering raising this uh, once more with the limit uh, being raised to £100. Um, and that, that obviously places greater challenge on the uh, likely use of cash uh, within those markets. We're looking at a number of announcements quite recently where banks are looking at pooling ATMs, uh, using automated kiosks, uh, and even considering shared branch networks. Uh, so in Australia, the big four banks have been talking about pooling their ATMs uh, and possibly even doing branch sharing. Uh, and just a few weeks ago in Turkey, uh, the, there was a paper issued around the pooling of, uh, of ATMs uh, as well. I touched upon the phone playing a critical role uh, in the consumer lives, uh, and this has driven huge uh, numbers of people to adopt digital wallets. Uh, and there's no sign of uh, digital wallet growth uh, slowing down, uh, and this is a global phenomenon. But this also does create new cash out opportunities. Uh, they may, may be non-card based. Um, but uh, where you provide the ability for customers to cash out from their wallets, there's a new income stream available for you. I just want to take a quick look at you know, why is there so much growth in, in digital wallets and, and what is their value? And, and ARC uh, Investment Research, who, who are huge fans of organizations such as Tesla, uh, have done quite a lot of detailed research uh, on the topic. Uh, and in the USA, which, which is where they focus their, their market research on this, they've now identified that digital wallet users surpass the number of deposit account holders in the, in the largest of financial institutions. And they've done that very quickly. So the Square Cash app and PayPal's Venmo already have the same number or greater numbers of customers that they've acquired in just seven to 10 years that it took JP Morgan uh, 30 years and five acquisitions to reach, and that's around the 60 million user number.
They're also uh, attracting these customers at a fraction of the traditional costs. So where a traditional bank may, may have uh, spent $1,000 to acquire a new customer, a digital wallet customer due to social media, uh, viral peer-to-peer -peer, uh, payment ecosystems, savvy marketing strategies, and lower cost structures are achieving these, those same goals for around $20. And at maturity, these digital wallet users have a potential value of $20,000 if those digital wallets become consumer financial dashboards. On top of that, the, the earning power could be even greater if you start to look at lead generation for online and offline uh, commerce. And that could add a further $10,000 to those figures. So uh, ATM processors could position themselves uh, with their own digital wallets. Um, and something I'm going to touch on with SoftPos uh, in a moment, you could offer merchants digital solutions. Let's just take another look at some of these significant trends. This, this time, let, let's take a look at how the younger generation have been using the government stimulus payments. That have been paid out in the last 12 months. A huge number of this uh, group have used it to buy cryptocurrencies. And in the USA, in the last six months, the volume of ATMs that have enabled customers to cash out crypto has more than doubled. We're seeing stellar growth, and that's not just uh, limited to the US, we're seeing that worldwide in terms of uh, uh, cryptocurrency ATM cash out. In fact, in the UK, uh, just a few months ago, Cash Zone, which is a brand of Cardtronics, announced that they were going to enable um, Bitcoin Cash Out. And Cash Zone themselves have over 16,000 ATMs in the UK market. So today there's over 18,000 pure cryptocurrency ATMs, and there's over 275,000 other ATMs that are supporting crypto. And that, that number has grown by 143% in the last 12 months. What we're also seeing is the phone playing a critical role in the business lives, not just in consumer lives, but in merchant lives. And SoftPos, uh, which I'm going to demo to you and tell you a little bit more about, uh, was launched in mid-February 2020, literally weeks before uh, the, uh, the pandemic took over. And it's shown rapid adoption uh, during the course of the last year. And this creates new cash out opportunities. So for the rest of my talk, I'm actually going to focus on SoftPos uh, and I'm going to give you a demo of it. So we're, we're looking at the uh, going mobile trend, um, merchants using their phone to run their business. The phone is critical to the merchant's lives and demand for the instant service and convenience it already exists. Now, COVID has changed the lifestyles. Uh, a lot of small uh, business owners traditionally took cash, um, but due to the last year, they, they've, they've increasingly started to require to take contactless transactions. So this contactless payments need, plus the ability to use their mobile phone, um, ha has led to a growth in demand for SoftPos. For the small merchants, there's a perception that the point of sale can be both expensive and inconvenient and also inefficient. There are lots of small merchants that took, traditionally took cash that may have thrown their MPOS or POS device uh, into their tool bag or beauty kit and they'd often get damaged. But by using their own mobile phone and downloading an app from the Android Google Play Store, they can now uh, do that on their phone, which they take a lot greater care on. So the background to SoftPos was that the card schemes actually trialed this during the latter half of 2019 in both Poland and Turkey with local acquirers. There were some other um, trials that were going on. But by February, it was deemed to be a success and the schemes decided to give their blessing to this rolling out. Nobody realizing that literally weeks later, uh, the world would uh, uh, enter a new phase. So the different types of payment methods that you can take through your mobile app are uh, both um, MasterCard and Visa. Um, there are different um, 
above CVM limit ways uh, of, of taking that. So you can use pin on glass as an approach, or you can use a 3D secure to e-commerce approach. You can take QR codes, you can take mobile digital wallets such as Apple Pay, Google Pay, Samsung Pay, and also uh, e-wallets uh, that are digitally used as well. Uh, and we're starting to see uh, open banking coming as well. So, for example, in Poland, Blick, which has been a phenomenal success, uh, has now announced that in June, NFC contactless payments will come to their real-time payment method as well. So how can uh, you uh, use this to help drive uh, ATM visits and income for you? Well, uh, one uh, organization, uh, Paynetics, which is a European processor, has, has now used SoftPos to expand its merchant base in over 14 countries. Merchants sign up within minutes via a slick, fast digital onboarding experience on their website. The merchant is allowed to immediately download and use the application after submitting their KYC or K KYB details. In the background, Paynetics completes the uh, Know Your Customer, Know Your Business checks, and any first settlement file is held back uh, until that process is complete. Now, where Paynetics have actually uh, taken a very clever approach on this is that they've, been, they've offered their merchants a choice of settlement options. So you can have a standard settlement to the bank account on a T plus three day basis. In low volume scenarios, that can actually be monthly uh, as well. But what the vast majority of merchants uh, have opted to go for is payments to a Paynetics prepaid issued debit card on a T plus one day settlement basis. Now, there's a little bit of risk in, in here for, for Paynetics, but not much. What it does is it, it, it drives people to take their uh, branded prepaid debit card. And rather interestingly, a large number of those merchants then decide to visit an ATM and take funds off of their card. So that, that's one way that you could create a, an ecosystem to help you drive additional income. And this is where ATM operators have a distinct marketing advantage. So um, you, you, can, uh, you have a key asset, you have physical locations, physical devices, usually in a good location with good footfall, frequented by high cash users, and you have visual screens and space on the hardware for stickers as well as advertising. For a few minutes, you've got a captured focused customer. You can provide QR code stickers on the ATM or kiosk to drive the download of the SoftPos application. And you can do the screen advertising as well. So you already have a very low cost way to rapidly advertise to interested merchants. And with just around four, 500 to 800 active merchants, your costs are covered. So this is a very, very uh, low cost, very rich way to actually uh, earn income. And interestingly, merchants are willing to pay a premium in order to take soft pause applications. So in Central and Eastern Europe, these merchants are willing to pay five euros a month in order to have their uh, soft pause application in addition to the transaction processing fees that are charged. So how does FOSS work? Well, uh, FOSS is a, is a form of soft, soft pause. You would go to the Google Play Store and you would download the app. Now, for it to work, you, you need a combination of, of uh, your registered email address and a unique user code that, that's provided by the uh, the platform when you sign up. Once you've downloaded this, you can do sales, you can issue receipts, you can look at some basic analytics, you can look at some transactions and you can take actions such as void or cancellation, and you can do refunds. And in the settings function, you can set things like language uh, as well. And you can white label the app. So the app, so, so the solution comes in both white labeled app format or even an SDK format that you could integrate with uh, with other features as well. So what I'm actually going to do now is switch to share my phone screen um, and I'm actually going to give you a demo. And I'm going to use for the purposes of the demo a uh, contactless uh, Visa debit card that I've got. I'm just going to switch screen. And. 
So, okay, um, I've, I've now shared my phone screen and hopefully that's working. Um, and I have already been through a process where I've downloaded the FOSS app. So I've set Stanchion up as a merchant for this. And I'm going to, to press on this. And at this moment, the FOSS app is doing a security check. Now, in this particular case, the app is, and the terminal management system is hosted in AWS in Frankfurt. And as you can see, it's gone straight into doing a sale. I'll just go to the home page for a moment. We've got FOSS there. We've got Paynetics, which is the uh, level three certified acquirer that I mentioned earlier on, and Stanchion as a merchant. What I can actually do here is I can uh, change the language so I could have Greek for argument's sake, and then, then I would have my screens all in Greek. Um, but as that doesn't mean very much to me, uh, I'm going to go back to English for the purposes of, of doing this. So back to the English version, I've got the ability to do a sale, uh, and that's what I'm going to do right now. So Imagine that I've got a customer in, in front of me. This is going to be a live transaction, so I'll do this for 36 pence. Um, I'm going to press confirm. So the merchants entered 36 and, uh, pence for the value of the product being bought, and they now ask the customer to present their card. So I'm going to take my card. I'm just going to present it to the back of my phone, which is what I've done. At this point, the app is routing the transaction off to the acquirer. He's routed it to the scheme, which is Visa and the payment is successful. Now, at this particular point, I could send an SMS um, as a receipt. I could send an email. I could link it to a Bluetooth printer. Or if I'd use my Apple Pay or Google Pay wallet uh, to pay, I'd probably want a QR code receipt. I'll just close out of that. I can take a look at some analytics. Um, so I've done two transactions today. I did a test transaction just before this, and I can look at my transactions within here. So I can uh, void the transaction and cancel it, uh, or I can do a refund. Uh, in this particular instance, I'll do a refund. I can do it uh, up to the maximum value, so I'll do it for 36. And under card scheme rules, I have to represent my card for the refund. So I'm just going to confirm the refund represent my card. You can see how fast that works. Card red's okay. It's successful and the refund is successful. So at that particular point, I've demonstrated how SoftPos works. And um, uh, as mentioned earlier, it also supports the ability to take above CVM limit transactions. I'm just going to... Um, Uh, stop presenting uh, and I'm going to uh, hand over at this particular point to uh, Steve Gildy of uh, Paragon who's going to talk about uh, the vis virtualization and automation of ATM testing. So Steve, um, over to you. Great. So thanks again, Norman. I appreciate this opportunity to speak with the audience today. For those of you who are not familiar with Paragon, we are an independent software company focused on providing testing solutions to the payment industry. We have been in business for more than 25 years, and our focus is on helping clients like ATM deployers take control of their payments testing environment. We work with our customers in partnership to help increase efficiency, expand test coverage, improve quality and reduce costs. And two com critical components in our solution strategy are virtualization and automation. And as we've heard today so far from uh, Norman and uh, the uh, other presentations, there is a, still a, an awful lot of change going on in the industry. But before we get into that detail, I, I think it's important to take a quick look back at 2020. This is a slide that uh, tracked the progression of COVID lockdowns uh, across the globe so far from March 2020 to March 2021. And I've included a link in the presentation materials. It's actually quite interesting to see how this uh, uh, pandemic progressed across the globe. Um, the, the interesting part of that uh, um, review is that you can see that just about everything that uh, could go wrong last year did go wrong. And the impact was especially hard on the ATM channel. So we have, have lockdowns, which still persist in many regions that prevent people from getting to or accessing ATM test labs. 
Many ATM locations have become inaccessible. We talked earlier about concerns with dirty ATMs and infected cash keeping people away from ATMs. We know that many organizations were not prepared to effectively support remote workers, especially ATM developers, testers, and QA staff. And again, as we've talked about, consumers are turning aggressively to e-commerce and other form forms of touchless interactions, such as P2P uh, payments. And while COVID is only a contributing factor, we continue to see pressure on cash in many markets. We talked about declining ATM volumes. We certainly see competition for banking services from big tech and fintech disruptors. And of course, we always have ongoing legal and regulatory pressures. So was everybody prepared for a disastrous year like 2020? Uh, uh, certainly not. A better question is, was anybody actually prepared for a disastrous year like 2020? And I, I think we know the answer to that question. And so the next question is, what are we going to do about it? Testing has not historically been considered a critical business function in most dis disaster recovery scenarios, but we certainly have never seen anything like the COVID catastrophe before. Now, with the long-term impact of the pandemic still unclear, testing has become a critical requirement for maintaining productive business operations. And one of the things that we uh, talk about in our uh, little part of the industry is everything that changes must be tested. And of course, there's a lot of change taking place. And we, despite the issues with COVID, we know that everybody still has a job to do. Um, even as we try to recover from the COVID hangover, there is tremendous pressure for us to get back to business as usual. And that, that business as usual, usual, even though nothing is the same as it was. I'm guessing, but I'll bet that nearly everybody listening today has some sort of a 2021 business plan that looks something like this. Everybody wants to grow. Everybody wants to innovate. Everyone uh, wants to get better. And I'm guessing that those of you who have seen your business plans are trying to figure out um, how are you going to continue to do more with less? Unfortunately, there is no going back uh, to what we considered normal before 2020. The world is a fundament fundamentally different place, and it's going to require that we perform even better than we did before, and that's where automation comes in. Forrester says that automation is now a business imperative, and if you don't automate your business, you may not survive. And to be sure, things are not going to slow down. They will only continue to accelerate. Think about what Andrew said about next-gen ATMs, about contactless EMV, about the Internet of Things. Uh, the pace of change will continue to advance. And it's uh, at the same time, it's getting harder and harder to stay ahead of the competition. You may have seen this recent public statement from Jamie Dimon, CEO of JP Morgan Chase, in his 2000 letter 2021 letter to his shareholders. The letter clearly highlights by name several organizations that have become or will become Chase's biggest competition. And unfortunately, Mr. Diamond is not alone in voicing this concern. Many bank CEOs see technology companies and not other banks becoming their major competitors over the next few years. And while JP Morgan Chase is one of the largest banks wrestling with this issue, they are certainly not the only one. In fact, in many ways, the competition is already well ahead of most financial institutions. And one of the key reasons for this is the speed at which FinTech and Big Tech organizations operate. This chart helps to illustrate how quickly some of these companies deploy changes into their environment. This capacity for speed is based largely on their use of automation. We are aware of many banks that still are only able to digest one or two major releases per year. And this growing speed differential means that many institutions will fall farther and farther behind. In fact, it should be even more concerning to other financial institutions that a bank as large as Chase is so worried about fintech competition. As you can see from this chart, Chase spends significantly more on IT every year than any other bank, and that is still less than what a than less than half of what Amazon invests. Under no circumstances are you going to be able to outspend your fintech competitors. So now we start to get into the really interesting stuff. Uh, for most financial institutions, testing represents a significant percentage of both their IT budget and their overall development process. 
it also represents a significant barrier to success. To further complicate matters, a significant percentage of that testing is still being done manually. And a recent survey of 2000 execs conducted by Capgemini as a part of their annual world quality report, response in, respondents indicated that only around 15% of all testing was automated. And this is especially true when it comes to testing around the payment channels. In their recent ebook, Top Strategic Technology Trends for 2021, Gartner highlights the need for testing automation and states that everything that can be automated should be automated. They clearly point out that automation is a key requirement for e improving efficiency and reducing costs. And a 30% savings uh, based on automation is significant. Unfortunately, many organizations indicate that the number one reason that they cannot automate more of their testing is the very same reason why they need to automate more of their testing, and that is the speed at which things are changing. Well, obviously, that means it's time for some alternative thinking. We often advise clients that the most important step is the first step, is just to get started. Automating the most common testing processes can generate enough savings to fund additional investments. When it comes to the ATM channel and testing specifically, and that important first step includes virtualizing the ATMs. A key advantage of virtualization that it minimizes the reliance on ATM hardware for testing and eliminates the need for staff to be physically in the test lab standing in front of an ATM so that they can test. We know of several instances where organizations have been forced to either ship ATMs to remote locations or move large numbers of people around the globe to finish their testing at the end of a long overdue project. Virtualization will eliminate the need for that sort of expensive contingency. In addition to facilitating the automation process, virtualization unlocks a number of additional opportunities. So your next question may be, so how do you virtualize an ATM? Well, the virtualization process allows Paragon to capture a complete image of the ATM, including the operating system, all the ATM resident applications, the log files, et cetera. During the process, we also run a Paragon developed tool that discovers all the XFS hardware components that are installed on the machine. This diagram may help illustrate the process a little more clearly. We capture and virtualize the entire ATM hard drive. We capture and utilize the actual ATM screens. We uh, and we capture information about the hardware devices installed on the ATM, and then we simulate the appropriate components to complete the virtualization virtualization process. The virtual ATM operates exactly like the physical ATM. This diagram shows the next level of detail down. Note how the server based implementation allows users to access the system from anywhere. It also means that developers, testers, and QA staff can easily collaborate and share access to the virtualized ATMs, as well as test cards and scripts, test media, uh, such as cache bundles and check images, as well as test results and reports. And at this point, you can manage a virtual ATM just like you would a physical device. For example, you can use the same software update process. In fact, many of our current clients specifically deploy patches to the virtual ATMs first in order to make sure that everything with the patch works properly. It's a lot easier to deal with any issues that may arise in the virtual environment than it is working with a physical device that has been compromised in some way. Another interesting feature that's available with a virtualized ATM is the host proxy. This capability gives you the greater control of and visibility into the messaging between your virtual ATMs and your host systems. You can quickly and easily connect any virtualized ATM to your various test hosts without changing the IP address in the ATM application or having to restart the ATM. Once you uh, have the ATMs virtualized, you have a lot of flexibility to manage your testing environment. Do you need to clone a virtual ATM? No problem. You simply create multiple copies of the ATM to meet your testing requirements. Need to bring in more testing resources? Again, no problem. You can have additional resources access the available ATM images anytime from anywhere. And you can easily create and maintain a library of ATM images. For example, we've had many customers archive a set of Windows 7 images that can easily be accessible long after the fleet has been migrated to Windows 10. 
As previously mentioned, once the ATMs are virtualized, they can be deployed in a variety of environments. Here is an example of what ATM, ATM images look like when they're deployed in the Azure cloud. And the question of cloud comes up in literally every conversation we are having with both existing customers as well as new prospects. According to Retail Banker International, the banking industry has been relatively slow to adopt cloud computing compared with other industries. But advances in both technology and business imperatives, driven largely by the COVID pandemic, are driving financial services companies to embrace the cloud. A recent article in Forbes further promoted that suggestion, uh, saying that cloud is now a hot trend for financial institutions. The percentage of banks that have deployed cloud computing increased significantly in 2020, going from 32% at the end of 2019 to 40% at the end of 2020. And the general sentiment in the industry has shifted over the last few years to a point where many, if not most, banks and credit unions believe that they are on an inevitable journey to the cloud. During 2020 and now into 2021, Paragon has, has assisted several clients to deploy testing assets in AWS, Azure, and GCP. It, just one last diagram that shows a template for how the virtual ATM environment can be deployed in the cloud. This again is an example using Microsoft Azure. Cloud is at the center of what Gartner calls anywhere operations. Gartner says an anywhere operations model will be vital for businesses to emerge successfully from COVID-19. At its core, this operating model allows for businesses to be accessed, delivered, and enabled anywhere that customers, employees, and business partners operate in physically remote environments. Enough about virtualization. Once we have the ATMs virtualized, we can start to look at automation. We typically think of ATM automation in three main categories, record and playback, data-driven, and automated regression testing. The record and playback capability helps automate your functional testing. Your testers record every step of a transaction so that it can be played back whenever is required, exactly as, or, as it was recorded, and it can be played back over and over again. One additional thing I want to point out on this screen is that once you have an ATM virtualized, you can have you have the flexibility to configure the virtual ATM fascia any way you need. So you can locate or move the card reader, the printer, depositors, dispensers, anywhere you want. And in this example, you can see that I have included visibility of the rear supervisor screen on the front of the ATM to help facilitate the testing process. Another nice thing about working with virtual ATMs is it can simulate a wide variety of fault conditions without any risk of physical damage to the actual ATM. For anyone who has ever experienced an overzealous fault test on an in the ATM lab, you know that it is no fun at all having to deal with a fallout from a test gone wrong and a damaged ATM. Paragon includes a, a substantial number of fault options in the ATM simulator. These faults can be configured and included in the record and playback scripts so that you can consistently and accurately recreate the faults that the same way every time during subsequent automated test runs. And while this is not specific to ATM faults, the simulator also provides a detailed log of the interaction between the ATM application and the XFS hardware devices. This is very useful when investigating or or troubleshooting unexpected ATM behavior. The final point about record and playback uh, automation is that the virtual ATM simulator can check and validate all of the interactions during the transaction, including the, including the display. The simulator can be configured to use pixel by pixel comparison or optical character recognition on a screen by screen basis. The simulator can also be set up to ignore all or parts of the screens a useful option when the screen contains animations. For any transactions that are run, either individually or as part of an automated test set, reports are produced to specifically identify all the steps, timers, screen interactions, and any errors that may have occurred during the transactions. The reports can be saved along with the test results to serve as a historical archive of the test run. Once your functional transactions are locked in, you can start to take advantage of additional levels of automation. Transactions can be exported out of the simulator in two different directions. 
Uh, any record and playback items can be exported so that they can run from external systems via the virtual ATM API. This data driven interface can be used to interact with the ATM without the need to use the simulator interface. This facilitates integration with other enterprise systems such as Jenkins and can be used to initiate the exported transactions either as is or, the, or to use the full capabilities of the API to conduct data driven what if testing. In this example, the API is being driven by data contained in a simple Excel spreadsheet as seen in the lower left hand corner of the display. Depending on different responses that may come back from the ATM application or even from the host, the API script can be used to modify, modify the flow of the transaction. At the bottom right hand corner of the display, you can see that all the ATM screens are also being captured so that they can be used as part of the transaction archive. This API capability is especially useful when it comes time to integrate the ATM channel with your enterprise CI CD pipeline process. Back to the simulator for just a moment. Another automation option is to move the transactions into the underlying WebFast test platform. Transactions are imported into WebFast test as ATM messages. Automation options at this point include running the transactions back to the virtual ATM simulator or running them directly into an ATM device driver or switching system like Postillion. The transactions can be grouped into transaction sets for automated regression testing and scheduled to run at any time. The messages can also be edited and manipulated so that additional testing can be done to specifically check how a device driver or a host system will respond. Another automation option is to use the transactions for performance testing. In this example, we have ATM transactions as well as Visa ISO messages set up to run in a mixed workload environment. We see more and more clients who want to run performance tests daily to ensure that their processing systems not only handle individual transactions correctly, but that they operate efficiently at scale. So there are many benefits to automation, and we believe that automating your test environment will deliver a number of these to your organization. Uh, automation helps improve test coverage. It improves the quality of the transactions by being able to create and recreate specific scenarios over and over again. It improves your time to market for delivering new products and services and helps you reduce project cycles. You get repeatable, verifiable, and auditable test results. Automation helps improve collaboration and allows valuable staff to focus on higher value tasks like developing new products and testing strategy. Of course, we believe that it reduces costs and it gives uh, additional opportunities for integrating your payment testing environment with your broader enterprise. And ultimately, automation means competitive advantage for your organization. And virtualizing your ATMs is the first step in that journey. Payments remain a critical thread in the fabric of our everyday lives. The payments industry will certainly continue to grow and evolve to meet changes in consumer preference and buying behavior, as well as advances in technology. In order to stay relevant and competitive, financial services organizations need to continually innovate while at the same time speeding time to market for new products and services, increase efficiency, and reduce costs. The best defense against competition and to respond to disasters when they ultimately happen is a robust and automated testing strategy. Unfortunately, some organizations still rely primarily on manual test testing processes that simply cannot keep up any longer. History has shown us over and over again that when the unexpected happens, and it will happen, comprehensive testing can stop the first domino from falling and prevent a disastrous chain of events. If we learned or relearned anything in 2020, it is to expect the unexpected. If you have any follow up questions or would like to talk in more detail about anything you've heard, feel free to send me a note and we can set up a time to talk. You may also want to visit the website or the map. There is the third uh, hyperlink down and I thank you for your time, Norman, and I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, ahead of schedule, that's uh, pretty rare when, when we're hosting large events like this. Uh, 
uh, excellent presentation. We're, we're now going to uh, go over to uh, Dion Van Bullion, uh, who will introduce himself and talk about skills augmentation to reduce cost and risk. Dion, over to you. Fantastic. Thank you, Norman. Um, I assume you can see my screen as well? Yes, we can. Fantastic. So, um, um, once again, thank you. My name is uh, Dion van Bouillon, as you can see on the screen. I'm the Group Product Director for Stanchion um, and uh, based in the UK. Um, and after Norman um, and uh, Andrew spoke about uh, a great deal of new technology coming down the, uh, uh, the pipeline, um, I um, want to turn our attention a little bit more towards um, the operational side of, um, uh, of ATM uh, um, uh, processing. Um, at Stanchion, we've got uh, a large number of, of customers globally who um, do some type of, of operational management um, and they scale from large tier one organizations uh, to much uh, smaller um, organizations with a much smaller uh, estate of ATMs. And, but we have found that this uh, consistency uh, uh, um, in terms of the challenges that these types of uh, organizations um, face. And I'd like to just talk through some of those and also talk about how we um, at Sanction provide uh, a solution in that, uh, in that space. So just as a starting point, um, I'd like us to, to look at uh, this slide around um, maturing, uh, monitoring maturity. Uh, it's a slide that I got from our friends at uh, Anitco. Um, who's uh, a part of our um, solution suite. Um, and you'll see there's a, there's a range here, and I'm pretty sure that uh, each of you can put yourself into one of those categories. Um, on the left-hand side is the worst-case scenario when it comes to uh, monitoring maturity. Um, it really is the, is the, is the case where when, as soon as something goes wrong, as soon as there's a problem, it comes completely out of the blue, um, and the operational team goes from um, uh, idle to uh, uh, chaos mode. Um, I'm pretty sure, based on all the names I've seen on the attendee list, nobody uh, sits in that reactive category. Um, but it then scales through to um, uh, the, the predictive um, side, the strategic approach to monitoring, where, where challenges are uh, foreseen. Um, and um, the operational team can respond before a problem occurs. I suspect there's a, a, a lot of organizations sit in the middle as well, where there's some form of monitoring happening, um, but it's not um, particularly focused on, on, on preventing problems, but rather um, responding quickly. So just zooming out a little bit then and looking at the, the types of operational challenges that we see across our um, uh, across our customer base. Um, you know, I remember you know, a, a number of years ago how um, we were able to think of a um, ATM environment and the number of transactions and the type of transactions were actually quite simple. And today, um, as we've heard in some of the other presentations, we need to take into account uh, digital wallets. We need, need to take into account uh, QR codes. We need to take into account uh, tokenization. And all of these um, system complexity that's been added to the environment has um, made the day-to-day -day operations a lot more tricky to manage. And all of the additional complexity have resulted in um, a lot uh, of performance data that probably was not available uh, before. And what has happened in many cases is that the performance data is overwhelming operational teams. There's just too much information to look at, too much to deal with, and ultimately um, effective action gets, gets lo lost in the noise. Also, with the um, growing in complexity, there's suddenly a much larger need for specialist skills um, in specific areas. Um, so, so one of those areas that, that, that commonly pop up and um, that we see is around security. Um, and organizations 
have to make um, uh, choices around how to, to manage those risks, whether they appoint people internally with their skills, whether they bring consultants in, um, everything is a, is, a, is a decision point. And maybe one of the key points to make there is that when an organization do decide to appoint a specialist in a specific area, um, as soon as that person joins, they become a, uh, a key man risk. Um, and, and that in, in, uh, creates inherent risk in itself. Um, I have to add that uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, you do need generalists in your organization, people who can um, do day-to-day uh, um, -to -day tasks, but, but the, the need for specialists should not be um, underestimated. Over and above that, um, one of the, the 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 trends that we're seeing is the constant need for for maintenance. I think, as Steve now mentioned it as well, um, there's there's um, always new hardware upgrades, software upgrades, patches that need to be installed, um, and it often becomes a drain on the operational uh, team just because it's 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 always there, it's always a burden um, that they're carrying, um, and and it's one of the uh, easiest areas of operational management um, that, uh, that gets neglected. Um, also, knowledge management. Um, knowledge management talks about uh, access to um, information, both generic information and organizational specific uh, information, and that's uh, complete and it's easily accessible and ultimately um, documented. Um, all too often, we, uh, we see situations where uh, key information around um, an organization's um, payments environment uh, sits in the, in the mind of, of, of one or two people. And we all would have been in meetings where a specific issue is being troubleshooted or operational problem is being discussed. Um, and one person would say, yes, I've seen that problem uh, in the past, and this is how you deal with it. And then normally our reaction to that is relief because we've got a solution to the problem, but then also annoyance that um, that critical piece of information wasn't available sooner. Uh, and, and knowledge management is, 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 is tricky to get right. Also at the same time, um, the, the workflows around operational management is um, often um, an inhibitor to, to performance rather than um, something that uh, uh, assists in, in, in good performance. And there are two um, extremes when it comes to defining the workflows and the processes around operations management. The one is where the processes are just too generic um, and the, um, every time it's, there's engagement with the process, boxes are just ticked in order to get to the end result. Um, it's, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't actually add value. On the other end of the scale, you have overbearing processes that are really difficult to follow and are very time consuming and costly and, and quite often um, just frustrating. Um, the, to find the middle ground in terms of, of, of the processes you follow around your operations um, is key. Um, and they're also unique to each organization, um, but it's, it's, it's important to get right. Then in terms of the monitoring tool, usually, usually specifically, um, there as well, uh, part of the challenge with, with, with monitoring is that there are so many tools available. Every time you buy a new software package that um, uh, contributes to your bigger payments environment, it normally ships with a, a monitoring tool of some sort. At the same time, there are a great deal of, of very useful open source monitoring tools available. Um, and there are also very specialized monitoring tools uh, uh, in the market uh, as well. And deciding which tool to use um, is, is quite important. We also need to differentiate between application monitoring tools and network monitoring tools because they give you a whole different uh, uh, set of data. Um, and the reason I, I, I call that out specifically is um, it's, it's incredibly important that monitoring data is trusted. 
Um, too often um, we see organizations use a specific tool and attach a great deal of value to um, the data that they look at and the data actually just gives them a warped view of what's really happening um, behind the, the scenes in their, uh, uh, in their environment. Um, specifically, when they've got different tools for different parts of the organization um, and the tools do not um, um, sync up uh, and do not match up in terms of, of, of the information it provides. Um, I want to show you a specific picture um, just on this. So, so this little dashboard you see here, the, the content of it is not important, um, but you all would have, if you've been in an operational environment, would have seen um, a screenshot like this or a dashboard like this. This actually comes from one of our uh, production environments. Um, and there's, there's, there's quite a lot of detail on there. Um, and one of the key points we, we try to get across to our customers is that every single one of those data points need to mean something. Um, and it needs to add value. Um, and it needs to um, be connected to all the other data points you are looking at. Um, we, we have found that in many cases, uh, when, we set up, we, when we set up a monitoring tool for a customer, there are up to 500 of these different types of data points that we want to, at any point in time, um, uh, have a look at and, and be able to, to, to monitor um, in, a, in an automated manner. Um, but selecting those specific data points are incredibly important. Um, and one of the, one of the challenges uh, is often that um, organizations monitor data for the sake of monitoring it, as opposed to having a specific um, purpose. So then just a, a couple of, of, of comments around how some of these challenges can be addressed. Um, it's obviously a very wide field that we're talking about here and there's a lot more to talk about than just these bullet points that I've got on this slide but these are the, the critical um, uh, bullet points that we've um, that we've seen um, amongst our customer base. The one is that it's incredibly important to have customer focused monitoring. So monitoring that specifically looks at the the, the uh, experience that the customer is is having and in the context of the discussion today the experience the customer is having from an from an ATM from the moment they put in their card until they walk away with the cash until the funds are settled um, it's 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 not good enough to just to monitor um, the the ATMs separate from the transaction switch separate from uh, some of the other systems that you might have um, so take a holistic view and make sure that the data points across the various um, systems and environments are properly connected. Secondly, um, and this, this often gets lost um, just because you know, organizations are busy and there's, there's so much to do, but, but you do need to constantly review your risk appetite. At any point, um, an organization is making a decision around um, how much risk they're wanting to uh, take on, um, as opposed to how much um, they're willing to spend on hardware or software or people. Um, and there's always a decision made um, at a single point in time, and that decision needs to be reviewed constantly. If, if you're not reviewing your, your, your risk appetite on a continuous basis, um, you're making a decision uh, um, as well. So just keep that in mind, um, what was correct and what was acceptable um, a couple of months or a year ago might not be acceptable uh, today still and needs to be needs to be reviewed. Then we often hear organizations talking about predictability and you know the need that they want specifically predictability around the service they provide and, and the SLAs and um, that they have in place with, with um, uh, their customers. Um, in order to build that predictability, you do need to get into a cycle of monitoring, evaluating and reviewing. Um, and, and what it really talks to is, is not using your monitoring data uh, only to identify problems uh, in the environment, but to identify opportunities to improve um, and to rectify um, issues before they, before they become significant. Um, in, the, in the extension process, 
we do this on a weekly basis. On a weekly basis, we sit with the monitoring data of the of the last week. We um, have specialists looking at the data to um, spot trends, to spot changes based on the previous month, the previous quarter, the previous year, and then see what changes they need to make either to the monitoring data we look at or to um, um, you know, for possibly software uh, configuration and, and sometimes even hardware changes. So that, that cycle needs to be constant um, and, and uh, we need to be diligent around, around deploying it. In terms of analytics, um, I will say there just that analytics for the sake of analytics is um, not very useful. You do need to start with, with, with the question that you want answered rather than just putting data together. Um, all of us have analytics of some sort. Some of it might just be an Excel spreadsheet um, that automatically pops up in your inbox once a week. Um, in some cases, I know that it's a lot more sophisticated. The point is, um, make sure that analytics actually answers a question that you want answered. And then secondly, once you've decided what question you want answered, make sure that you have that information in real time. It doesn't help to get it um, a month later when, when it's too late to, to react. And then getting back to just building a knowledge base, I mentioned this in a previous slide as well, but it's so important that um, an organization gets into the discipline of documenting um, the environment, the environment variables, the um, performance of the environment, what's expected, and then continuously add to that and learn from it. Um, it is something that is not addressed by giving motivational speeches to operational teams. It is really a, a culture that needs to be cultivated. Um, and, and once again, it's, it's something that's, that's uh, close to our heart extension. Um, and then I guess the last on this specific uh, topic, the, the need to address uh, skills and experience gaps. Um, sometimes uh, it's not, it's, the, the answer is not to hire more people or to train your team uh, uh, better. Sometimes you do need to bring skills in from the outside on a, on a, case, to, a case by case basis. Um, and the expectation of the types of skills um, that you need to, to, to manage your system uh, properly needs to be, um, yeah, your expectation needs to be, needs to be high. Um, and uh, it just wastes so much time um, and money not having the right people look at the um, at the right problems at the right time. In terms of analytics, I just want to show you this slide. Um, so at Stanchion, we use a number of building blocks, um, and one of those building blocks uh, is the Anetco platform. Um, and I found this uh, slide uh, from Anetco quite interesting. Um, you'll see that the little graph there uh, talks about the reduction in time required to deal with um, specific um, uh, access to information. The, uh, the ones that were inter interesting to me was the cash utilization analysis and the ATM placement and lease renewal, um, the improvements there, and then the internal ad hoc requests were also quite uh, uh, um, interesting just because I see so much of it on a day-to-day -day basis um, in, the, in the organizations that we deal with. Um, so that reduction in time required is obviously quite significant and lead directly to um, um, cost savings. Um, I, I'm not going to go through the reasons how all of that uh, was done, but I, I do think that um, having just the, the right information all consolidated in a single, in a single source and creating some automation around how that data is extracted and cleansed is um, is the key. So taking all of that into account, um, you know, I've spoken a lot about what, what you know what Stanchion has learned and what we see. Um, but we have we have over the years, um, and we've been doing some type of hosted um, serve or, or some type of managed service for customers for 20 odd years now. But over the years, we've we've changed it into um, a very specific solution that tries to get ahead of the curve and get um, our customers out of a reactive mindset. So what we do is we don't replace teams, we really come alongside existing operational teams and augment them. We try to find the gaps 
in operational teams that exist today and specifically place skills um, in the in the right seats. Um, and we do a lot of that uh, through remote work and using cloud technology. Um, it's a, a, a COVID in that in that sense have been uh, great for us because we had a, a lot of the the processes and technology in place already. Um, so most of the team sits in Cape Town, but we've got a team, team spread out around the globe um, that contribute uh, to the um, uh, to the Swissquare offering. We have specific expertise in system administration, maintenance and monitoring, all the things we've just spoken about. Um, it's at the heart of what we do. And a lot of that we try to um, uh, automate as much as possible. Um, we believe that, um, you know, everything that uh, can be automated should be automated a little bit like what Steve said earlier as well. Um, it's, it's, um, it's a necessity. We have built our own um, specialist tools um, that we review and update on um, a very regular basis. Some of these tools have been built on some of our partner products um, where we've owned, where we've added our own IP um, and some of it we've just built from the scratch up. Uh, from, from scratch up is and um, it's um, it's really tailored specifically towards the types of payments environments that we that we manage. Uh, as part of the the offering, there's a 24/7 um, monitoring uh, that we do. Um, that uh, I guess is is at the heart of of um, a lot of the other processes that we follow. Um, all of that remote monitoring goes of operator intervention as well. Um, and we find that um, the, the ability for us to respond quickly when uh, issue arises is, um, is, is one of the uh, key benefits that our customers um, value. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of operational, weekly, daily operational reports, uh, executive reports on a, um, on a monthly basis that we produce. Um, and over and above all of this, we also provide business as usual support and consulting. And it talks to the need for specialist skills that I mentioned earlier. Um, sometimes you don't need to have somebody permanently in-house to deal with, with, with certain types of issues. Um, and in those cases, we can, we can parachute somebody in. So I've rushed through all of that, but it's uh, exactly on the time that Norman gave me. So um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Norman. Well done, Dion. Uh, that's excellent. Okay, so uh, we, we've, we've got about uh, five to ten minutes for a uh, question. Hi, Norman. It's Rudolf from Stanton, South Africa. I've got a quick question for Steve just on the ATM test automation. I was I was curious to understand what sort of time frames are an organization looking at when moving over from, you know, an existing physical testing in, uh, infrastructure to the automated infrastructure. Well, every customer environment is different, of course, but we usually talk in a, a time frames of uh, a couple of months, three to four months to work through a process of uh, converting ATMs, implementing them into a customer's environment, education, training, uh, optimization, those sorts of time frames. Great. Thanks, Steve. And then Norman, I had one for you. I mean, here in Africa, of course, it's it's different markets, um, you know, just thinking about um, ATMs and also you mentioned soft pause and you know it depends on the maturity and the pervasiveness of contactless cards etc. But are you seeing in your region that um, soft pause is actually encroaching on existing physical pause uh, you know estates where um, people are using hardware at the moment but are looking to wholesale move off that to a soft pause type solution? Thanks. Yeah, so that, that, that's a very interesting question. In fact, we're, we, we've, we've just responded recently to one RFP where the uh, the bank is actually looking to wholesale replace uh, their MPOS environments and replace, uh, basically offer their merchants soft POS uh, for that. So, so that's quite a strategic change, uh, you know, re recognising that that's uh, taking place and th there's a number of drivers for that because in, in in that particular market that the bank was operating in uh soft pause has, has actually been live for 10 months now and um there's some very interesting learnings that are coming out of it so so first of all the merchants that go on to soft pause they prefer it 
because they're using their own personal device. They, they, they don't want to carry around another device. The breakage is lower. They feel more familiar using their own personal device than, than another device. But also the, uh, the battery life of using the SoftPos solution is substantially better than if you're using a tethered uh, MPOS type solution that, that may have been provided to those merchants. So, so we're, we're seeing a number of um, kind of what would normally be hidden usage factors playing into this. Um, but again, for the ATM environment, this is a whole new ball game for everybody. So, so it really is an open playing field. Uh, and, and a little bit like the question you addressed to Steve in terms of how long does it typically take to, to put this into your environments? Uh, and, and, and the average answer there would be about three months. Um, we stanchion have a number of tools that, that can help speed up the, um, the uh, implementation timescales uh, of that. And maybe we'll touch on that later on after some of the other speakers after the break. Um, but also the level three certification process that an, acqu uh, an acquirer would go through uh, on average takes around uh, eight weeks. So this this is a this is a solution that can be implemented really quite quickly. It can also be tested um, quite quite fast with merchants as well. So it it, it it's a very very good new revenue driver for uh, getting volumes through through the switch. All right, very good. So uh, appreciate the time today. Good afternoon, Michael Hartman with NCR. I run our um, digital first transaction processing team um, for our banking group. And I'm gonna walk through a couple of um, things that we're doing in the uh, the market today with our, our capabilities. So uh, Norman and team, I guess you guys can hear me okay. Is that right? Uh, we can. Yeah, yeah, loud and clear. All right. Perfect. Thank all right, welcome. very good. Um, all right, so here's what we've got. Um, so four um, objectives here. Uh, splitting terminal handling from the ATM switch. Then I'm going to walk through things in terms of the cloud and you know so why we are deploying via that and then what we are doing in terms of our terminal driving as a service offer and and then we're going to talk about what this does in terms of the remaining environment for making it more efficient for your switching capabilities so let's dive right in and my time here so a lot of this was already talked about in terms of the trends and then so essentially what's come out through a lot of research and everything is that over well over 60 to 70 percent of the changes that are need to be made to a switch um an acquiring switch is really driven based off of the changing specifications for the atm terminal driving and so with that being the case we'll um, is we've gone through the process at NCR to uh, essentially separate out that functionality so that the pace of change of what's going on with the, um, the, the terminal handling can run at a different pace of change than the rest of the switch. So, and this is all just based off of the concern needs for um, uh, more transactions, better experiences, et cetera. And so, um, and essentially the disparity in the, essentially the online and mobile channel versus what's possible at the ATM. And so trying to create a consistent performance there. So what we talk about at NCR in terms of digital first banking, that is what we are, um, working on with our solutions. And so let's just get right into what this means. So real quick, in terms of when we look at this, in terms of what does a terminal handler actually do? Uh, very basic things, you know, it's like we're receiving a transaction from the ATM. Obviously, we got to keep track of the transaction details, the cash movements, et cetera. So this is just purely as a level set. So with a lot of the things that's gone on um, 
lately is there's been a lot of focus on essentially bypassing the switch and doing um, basically direct connects to other systems so that we can get access to account opening, get access to other things like that that are going on on the digital channel. The complexity there is that we now create a scenario um, as soon as any of that stuff touches you know, physical media where it becomes a bit more of a challenge to maintain the balancing, the settlement essentially of what's actually occurred at the ATM. So uh, what we've done is essentially to, like I said, split out that functionality. And this is essentially part of the, you know, case for change for that. So as we progress, um, there's nothing necessarily new in terms of what it does. It's all about what, you know, how we're doing it. So when we look at this, the, you know, traditional switch today has the terminal handling switch together. Um, and what we're proposing to do is, um, you know, leveraging uh, authentic or customer's existing switch. We are dis disconnecting essentially and switching it to a general um, switch that can be used for issuing and acquiring. We'll talk some more about that. And then the terminal handler is focusing on all of the needs of basically communicating and managing uh, the ATM. OK, so as we get into this, what that really gets to is that allows us to go to the core banking essentially for on us transactions to and to the associated networks for the off us. It allows us to leverage um, new protocols so that we can more quickly um, connect to other services that are more common in you know, essentially traditional retail, uh, you know, so lots of advantages of splitting off again based off of the pace of change of what's going on in the consumer environment. So the other big thing that we've done with the terminal handler is to switch to configuration rather than code. So with the modern architecture, this is all um, driven on a cloud first architecture. We are uh, able to do this in a way where we're API driven, it's all configuration and gives a lot more flexibility. So what does this actually look like? in terms of deploying in a virtualized environment or a cloud environment. So what we historically did, um, and this probably isn't atypical from other software companies, is when you look at things in terms of the growth in financial services, everything was channel specific. Um, you know, so that's why the whole ATM infrastructure existed because the branch infrastructure already existed. ATMs were new, so ATM infrastructure started to exist. Oh, then the internet was invented, an online system was invented. Then Steve Jobs made the phones that much easier and better. And so then we had the whole mobile channel invented. Um, so with that, that was all like separate infrastructure historically. All sorts of efforts had gone into consolidating that into a set of shared services that's repeatable, cloud native, et cetera. So this is what this is driving, you know, what we are doing from a R and D perspective, um, from a architecture perspective on all of our applications now. Um, so what does that look like? Uh, cloud first, API first. Um, we are leveraging uh, more um, basically open source types of capabilities in ter terms of Kubernetes um, for the containerization. We've switched to um, leveraging more efficient uh, database types of technologies like Postgres. Um, the also the big change is 
just in terms of realigning a lot of our processes to truly support a DevOps um, continuous integration and delivery process. Uh, and we are now in the process of publishing <laughs> the APIs in a manner so that uh, it eases the ability to uh, essentially map to and leverage the capabilities. So, um, and we still retain the ability for supporting, you know, traditional on-premise as well or virtualization of machines. So, what this looks like just from a picture perspective, um, we're going through and basically all the functionality is being containerized. Um, it is cloud agnostic in terms of our uh, approach. However, um, part of our multi-cloud strategy and our cloud agnostic strategy is for different parts of our portfolio, we've got um, different development clouds. And so um, for our primary development for terminal handler that is, you know, first out essentially on Google Cloud, um, what does that mean? It, it really just means that we are tightly aligning to things from a development and security perspective, integrated in with things from a Google SRE perspective, um, and, and then also with it being Google Cloud, that's probably the most um, open <laughs> in terms of industry standards and open source to facilitate a um, essentially the, the ability to move from one cloud to another cloud. And also we've got the, everything built into there from a an automation perspective. Um, so the advantage of this is that this allows um, you know financial institutions to focus on on banking and a lot less on making all the technology work, right? So they can focus on business outcomes and turn essentially the IT aspects of this over to a to a focused team that's leveraging and providing the infrastructure and the um, resources to support the applications in, in an optimal and efficient manner. Okay, so oh, um, oh. all right. So terminal driving as a service. What we've got here is essentially a continuum from left to right. So if we look at things, it, it um, there's three main layers. There's the IT infrastructure, so that's like the traditional like servers and all that type of stuff. So if we focus on column one, um, you know, typically that's you know customer provided in the traditional model, right? On uh, the business application side, that's going to be getting into um, basically the provision of implementation of an ongoing support of the applications. Right, so we, um, you know, as an application provider, we provide the licensing, provide um, the support in the initial implementation, and maybe provide some ongoing services to help maintain the applications. Uh, and then layer three is, in, from a business function perspective, you know, the analysts for doing the day-to-day -day job, leveraging the applications and the management function for doing that, right? And so, in that traditional, um, in that traditional model, you know, if we're helping to support the application, um, application managed services, that would be a layer there. If we are also helping with um, either one-time or ongoing development. Um, you know, that would be application development services or a one-off project. So with that uh, being the standard on the left that's traditionally occurred, what now happens is as you move over to the right, 
you start taking advantage of more and more um, uh, base capabilities. And so what does that look like? So in that could be a customer in column two establishing their own relationship with Google Cloud or AWS or, or you know, Azure. And we may be providing the development services on top of that. As we move further to the right into column three, this starts to become our base offering of terminal driving as a service, right? Where um, we are providing in our own instance of Google Cloud, um, the, the software subscription inclusive of the people in terms of like an SRE team and obviously the IT environment, right? So um, further, we can provide ongoing development services in column four and potentially provide the business analysts as a staff augmentation to that function. And then to the far right would be, you know, business process outsourcing. All of this is looking at things from a customer specific scenario. OK, so in other words, this is for a specific, you know, financial institution that we are doing all of this on behalf of with a, um, you know, a, a programmatized, planned implementation specific to what that um, financial institution is looking to do. OK, so. Um, you know, so what, how does this make things more efficient and better? Uh, the, the aspects to think about here is in terms of, you know, today's ATM switch has the switching capabilities with terminal handling built in. And again, as we talked about, most of the um, complexity associated with the ATM switch is involved in all the changes, ongoing changes to the terminal handling based off of new transactions, new interactions of what um, they're trying to achieve uh, for the customer at the, the ATM. So by shifting those ATM specializations to the terminal handler, with this now um, makes possible some of the original design, right, of of removing the complexity and consolidating the switching environment and having, you know, an optimized terminal handling for ATM, uh, potentially for your POS. And from there, everything else is just consolidated back into the switch. So that drives, um, you know, with everything that's going on with the merchant acquiring space, the ATM acquiring, the overall complexity of additional payments. What, what I'm suggesting here in terms of the consolidation is, as, as I talked about, most of the complexity of an ATM switch was tied up in the terminal handling and the changes of what's going on there. And so by isolating that into a new separate terminal handler, what this allows, um, is the switch to focus in on all those aspects that are going on on the switching side in terms of supporting of new schemes, in terms of supporting of new payment types, in terms of faster payments, and allowing a essentially a consolidation or a collapsing into a singular switch that can um, support more and more capabilities from what's going on in the payment side, independent of and in parallel to what's going on from a consumer experience perspective that you need to be able to support at the eight. Remain the responsibility of the separate terminal handler. So we're essentially decoupling and allowing. Um, terminal handling to support the ATM channel to occur at its pace of change required to support the consumer changing consumer environment there and the switching to be on a pace of change based off of the emergence and need to support alternative payment schemes and methods 
um, in, in the market. So that's, you know, where, where we are looking to do to enable an optimized um, environment from a transaction processing perspective for the for banking industry um, so that we can um, facilitate essentially as virtualized of an environment as our customers want to do um, around the terminal handling or uh, model as NCR. So, um, you know, why, you know, NCR, I've just, you know, this is the picture that I didn't lead off with, but the, you know, I've been talking mainly around the connecting part down below and really just the transaction element. So the, the leftmost piece as it fits within our overall um, capabilities that we are focused on to support online and mobile, ATM self-service, and branch with our new um, Teller platform that we are uh, that we have brought to market. All of this being driven cloud native, open banking standards. Um, you know, focusing on optimizing the experience for for our customers. So. Uh, in summary, around the terminal handler, you know, we're separating it from the switch cloud first, modernized protocols, shift to config, not code. And the other piece that I'll say that on virtualization aspects of things is that we are doing things in an end to end um, perspective for an ATM. So so when we say hardware integrated, so we have the consumer application, the terminal handling, all the other aspects of monitoring, everything else, all quote unquote, as you would expect, essentially shrink wrapped to support the different hardware platforms out there. It is a multi vendor solution. Um, standards um, it, it, that we have gone down with in our end to end platform for ATMs. And so with that, I'd like to thank you. Happy to entertain some questions here. I'm approaching my last few minutes. Apologize for some of the audio challenges there with my internet connection, but uh, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, thank you very much, Michael. Um, has anybody got any uh, any quick questions for Michael? OK, so uh, as we move towards uh, an incre increased sort of virtualization of the environment, as, as we see organizations going more omni-channel and trying to handle um, the, the processing of, of lots of different devices and, and taking on cloud services, the one thing that remains uh, critically important uh, is, is security uh, and ensuring that, that we have strong cryptographic and, and encryption capabilities. So, uh, Roland, um, would you like to talk to us about how Futurex are, are, are enabling organizations to survive in this new world? Sure, thank you very much, uh, Norman. You, hopefully you can see my screen. We can, yes, thank you. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, so um, thanks for your time this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let me just uh, start off for those of you that are not familiar with Futurex. We've been in business for 40 years. We have some 15,000 customers worldwide. We're based out of uh, Texas, and all we do is make HSMs, hardware security modules, and certificate authorities and cryptographic devices. We make the biggest and fastest ones in the world, as you'd expect, coming out of Texas. And we were the first people to introduce cloud HSMs back in 2014 with a service that we call VirtuCrypt, and the first people to receive PCI PIN and PCI uh, P2P certification in 2015. Over the years, we have a complete range of on-premise devices that go from the Xcrypt Enterprise, which operates at 20,000 TPS, uh, an order of magnitude faster than anything else on the market. And then we have full remote management capabilities, compliant PCI certified remote management through the Xcrypt Touch, central management through the Guardians, 
and we supply uh, four of the five top uh, banks in the USA with our encryption devices. What we've done is we've taken all that we have on premise and we put it in multiple compliant um, data centers around the world called VirtuCrypt. So um, we've got more than 15 years experience in providing cryptographic management for very large HSM estates and specialize in uh, virtualization in some of these environments. Uh, we have universal interfaces to all major payment applications and can operate simultaneously in multiple command sets. We were the industry's first key management technology for financial services, and we fulfill all the regulatory and customer audit um, requirements. Uh, we've got more certifications than you could shake a stick at, but the important ones for, um, for HSMs are the FIPS 140-2 Level 3 and PCI certification. Then there's all the data center certifications and the other service certifications, for example, PCI PIN, uh, PCI point-to-point -point encryption, and more relevant for or relevant for USA TR39. We've also been audited by a lot of the major international card brands, people like uh, Visa, uh, major banks, and processors. So some of the success factors for our cloud-based HSMs: uh, we're the only HSM provider with PCI-approved multi-tenancy and HSM virtualization. Um, we offer full uh, SLA uh, for the five nines uh, in terms of uh, uptime, and we pay people if we aren't up to those levels. We've never paid anybody because we've never not met those. Um, we have automated on-demand provisioning and clustering of cloud payment HSMs. Um, we have payment-specific application blueprints for uh, rapid, easy, risk-free, hassle uh, onboarding. And if we look at the ecosystems that we offer, so the top one there is the range of financial processing that you would expect in terms of point-to-point uh, -point encryption, tokenization, et cetera. Um, I'm, I've taken one of the specific uh, environments for ATMs in terms of remote key loading for ATMs, and I'm going to uh, dive into some depth in a minute or two on that. But then we have all the other services in terms of data encryption. We are a CA in our own right, a certificate authority. We're a Visa certified CA. Uh, we offer complete key and certificate management and tokenization capabilities. And we have the ability to provide um, a hybrid environment where you perhaps could have your production environment on premise and your DR or test or UAT uh, in the cloud via VirtuCrypt. So a complete mix and match arena. So here, as most of you are in the uh, payment processing and financial arena, uh, these are three principal areas that we offer for that. So the full range of financial acquiring, full range of financial issuing, and of course, uh, uh, complete test and UAT environments. OK, so some of the service attributes, uh, you can go ahead and go for a, a cloud payment HSM. We call it the port, the core one or the poor one, Freudian slip, um, at 50 TPS. Uh, we then have our standard cloud payment HSMs, which operate from 250 TPS to 20,000 TPS per HSM. And we have the uh, ability to scale both, both horizontally and vertically and to build your own HSM architecture. Um, there's multiple SLAs, as, as I've said there and there's a whole range of add-on services. So if we look at the industry, the financial industry experience, so if you talk, take a look at the top right there, so we have our processor and industry relationships, uh, we are registered uh, ESO uh, for all major processors. Um, some of them are mentioned there, people like TSIS, First Data, um, some of the largest, if not the largest uh, uh, processors in the world. One of the unique things about our HSMs is that they do both general purpose and financial on the same HSM at the same time, which is unique to FutureX. We offer a whole range of uh, APIs and application support uh, that goes from our native Xscript API to the international command set, the standard command set, a full range of RESTful 
uh, interfaces, uh, Java Cappy, things like that, and also uh, PKCS11 as the sort of industry standard interface for general purpose. And we support all the uh, algorithms that you would expect, both in general purpose and financial. So uh, uh, duck put, for example, triple des, AES, etc. So if we take a look at the connection architecture, uh, you can go for a full uh, virtual crypt virtual environment in our fully certified and compliant data centers, or you can go for a combination of a mixed hybrid environment. And we partner um, quite closely with uh, Amazon and Azure, and we go through uh, virtual crypt access points, uh, uh, VAPs, uh, to the various uh, uh, regions for, for AWS as illustrated in this uh, particular slide. OK, I'm going to move on from that. So um, basically, we have a complete raft of virtual HSMs to offer for the cloud to significantly reduce your overall costs, be able to scale as you need them. But one particular area I think may be of interest is one of uh, ATM key management. And just for sort of a high level view for people that are not terribly familiar with this, um, ATM encrypting pin pads, so all, all pin pads on ATM devices require cryptographic keys for many purposes, working keys, operational keys, etc. And all those need pin encryption. So historically, um, these keys were either manually loaded on the ATMs in person under dual control with, with two um, key security people, or managed through the payment applications associated, the host payment applications associated with that. And I've just used um, uh, ACI Base24 as an example. So if you are looking to transition to a dedicated cloud solution, basically that removes many of the inefficiencies and cost with direct or host-driven ATM key management. And it also eliminates the dependence on payment applications uh, to facilitate the process. So bottom line to that is it's a much more agile, sleeker solution with a better return on investment and a far better total cost of ownership with um, extremely flexible um, environments and scalability. So where, does, where do we look at this in a little more detail? So, it gives you a complete single device ATM and incidentally point of sale remote key loading solution. Uh, so we offer uh, POS and ATM. Compliant with all the um, certifications required, integrates with all major manufacturers, easy to use APIs that support full automation, uh, supports a variety of key types, and its future friendly design allows for um, uh, guarding against any form of redundancy and scalability is uh, spectacular. So full key cycle management as well. And what do we mean by key cycle management? So just a little picture to illustrate that. So we use a device called the KMIS, the Key Management Enterprise Server with an RKL license. It's our own device. The device itself is a full certification authority. Um, so it's able to generate certificates and keys either individually or in bulk in a secure cryptographic device, um, PCI and FIP certified. It can replace and revoke auto replacement. It can delete certificates no longer in use and archive inactive certificates. They've got uh, whitelisting and establish keys, key exchange and export keys uh, as um, as key blocks or cryptograms. So high level overview still. So VirtuCrypt uses, I say, the KMIS uh, CA technology within its products. Um, the device is a, a certified HSM in its own right. Um, the certificate based it uses a PKI, a public key infrastructure, to facilitate mutual authentication between uh, the VirtuCrypt devices and services and the ATMs. Um, FutureX also supports signature-based authentication, so certificate or signature-based. So there's an ATM RKL agent that's um, uh, that's managed. It's a lightweight application on the ATM, and the application's generated by VirtuCrypt's KMIS. It's digitally signed to make the mutual authentication to establish the cryptographic uh, channel. 
And you've got three mechanisms, basically, that enable the key exchange. Um, and the keys can be intelligently managed and key rotated using uh, the full key lifecycle management without interrupting day to day operations. So those three environments are option number one there is to uh, initiate key loading process by pulling from the ATM uh, or you can push to the ATM or you can uh, schedule um, as required um, on a polling uh, type environment. So what else do you need to do? Well, you've got to, you've got to um, create a key transfer between VirtuCrypt and your host application. So VirtuCrypt allows for a key exchange key, a KEK for lack of a better word, and that's shared with the host application, whatever that host application is, to facilitate key sharing. Uh, there's multiple export methods available, so we can use the host API, which allows for on-demand programmatic retrieval by the host application, or CSV export, scheduled exports via uh, SMTP and secure FTP, to name just a few. So what are the overall benefits? So we've got centralized global key loading operations on a single platform to anywhere in the world. You've got full key lifecycle management. You've got a much better simplified and centralized audit compliance. The whole environment is PCI certified and it's backed technology uh, providing high security using FutureX's devices. It eliminates physical accessing of ATMs for key loading and reduces the potential for costly errors and rework. And probably particularly relevant in our current COVID times, rapid return on investment achieved through process automation, um, much better total cost of ownership, and the ability to scale upwards, downwards, and virtualize whatever you want to do, either from the RKL, which is a you know, specific application here, or by taking uh, advantage of cloud-based uh, HSMs, rather than trying to maintain your own on-premise um, farm of HSMs, if you like, or a state of HSMs. So how do you access VirtuCrypt? There's a multiple ways of doing it. Um, the easiest one is the VirtuCrypt intelligence portal, the VIP portal, which is a secure website for configuring and reviewing everything related to your organization's VirtuCrypt services. That's not just RKL, but anything that you might want to do from the elements that VirtuCrypt offers. And it provides a, a convenient location for VirtuCrypt monitoring services, setup, configuration, support requests, log access, etc. I'm not going to dive into this in any particular detail because this could be the subject of another 20 minute uh, presentation. Um, however, we offer a whole range of automation tools, FX tools, uh, function tools, Java tools, command line interfaces, wrappers, all those things with integration toolkits. Um, I can answer any questions on this in more detail later on, but you know we can, you can perform auto automatic operations on your FutureX crypto infrastructure. So anything that you can do, um, you know, with a GUI, for example, you can do programmatically with automatic scripting processes, user configuration, uh, key management, and create a full deployment of an HSM from scratch, and then replicate it rapidly across your environment. Now, one of the things that people have whinged about, and, and rightly so, is the ability when you move to the cloud to be able to manage and be in control of your own keys. Uh, and it's a very important point. So we offer BYOK, which means bring your own key. So customers can have full control over their cryptographic keys. They can either do this uh, through our ruggedized touchscreen remote uh, loading tablet, which is FIPS and PCI certified, operates in dual control, and you can carry out remotely um, compliant key ceremonies when you initially set up your devices and enter your LMK or um, MFK, your high level key. And it creates a TLS connection for encryption and mutual authentication, usable from anywhere in the world. Alternatively, you can use our key agent service. 
And uh, examples of BYOK would be, for example, um, our integration with uh, Amazon Azure and uh, Google Cloud platforms. Um, the key agent service basically delivers under dual control by VirtuCrypt's TR39 um, certified auditors and keys of exchange using the XGRIP touch, fully managed audit logs and compliance fulfillment. So those are two of the ways uh, that you can uh, manage your own keys. And I would recommend that you do bring your own key rather than allow third parties to have control of your uh, keys. And frankly, the keys are like having the, um, the keys to your safe. Uh, okay, in addition to that, we offer 24 by 7, 365 days of the uh, business critical support, level one to three support. And this is done through industry certified subject matter experts and Stanchion are certified, fully trained um, partners uh, and resellers for uh, both FutureX on-premise devices uh, and our um, cloud-based environments. So on that note, I think I've taken up most of my time, if not sneaked a couple of inches or, or a couple of minutes of question time. And there we are, questions and answers. Thank you, Roland. Uh, so yeah, we, it, we've, we've had a fantastic panel of uh, speakers today and um, really we're just opening this up to uh, questions and answers from, from anybody. Uh, has, has anybody got any questions uh, that they may have? Um, perhaps of Roland. Just, just whilst the uh, the talks have been going on, uh, our CEO Steve Kerridge um, would would perhaps like to give some thoughts on the talks uh, that he's heard today. While whilst you're perhaps collecting your thoughts for any questions that you may have. Um, thank you, Norman. Um, uh, first of all, um, thanks to all the speakers. Um, it's been an interesting. Uh, an interesting uh, set of presentations and uh, definitely lots of uh, food for thought anyway around the challenges that the um, uh, ATM and the, the self-service industry um, faces at the moment um, with the changes that we see in terms of um, uh, people's habits uh, and how they're going about uh, interacting with banking services. Um, but I think that, you know, challenges often throw up um, opportunity um, and I think the industry is probably uh, on the brink of, of, of some changes going forward anyway, um, as uh, we see a different uh, demographic in terms of, um, in terms of uh, consumers, uh, you know, with, with new generations uh, coming in. So um, I think that there is going to be a challenge for the industry in making, making itself relevant over the next few years, making sure that uh, it's in line with the trends and how people want to consume banking services. Um, and this is this will we'll talk to some uh, significant uh, integration issues, I think. Um, in, in terms of accepting new forms of um, new forms of payment, uh, uh, new ways of actually interacting with the consumer, uh, collecting information and providing information in different ways. Um, and I think that that will provide some opportunities for for some players in the market and obviously some challenges for others. Um, I think we've also heard today that, you know, there are significant changes in the way that we go around managing the estates and operating the estates as well, you know, with the changes that, that were talked about uh, by NCR and, and also Paragon. Um, so there is an opportunity here to look at um, the ATM uh, estate um, and, and decide on the most appropriate way that that should be provided to, uh, to one's customers. Um, and I think that, uh, you, you know, we'll see some significant changes again uh, around how organisations provide what has always been seen as a pretty core service uh, from a bank's perspective uh, in terms of issuing cash. But, you know, maybe that now will uh, will go through a number of different changes to make it more relevant again. Stanchion has been involved in quite a number of um, uh 
digital uh, transformation projects in the banking space uh, across uh, most of our uh, offices and most of our regions. Um, so we're building up a significant amount of experience with our customers now um, and helping them to, to meet some of these challenges. Uh, Dion obviously spoke uh, around um, how we can help from the point of view of skills, augmentation uh, and our switch care offering. Um, but it's about also helping those customers um, to think about the best ways that they can do uh, go about providing services to their customers, how they can increase the, the, the revenue, um, how they can look at uh, minimizing cost. Um, and we're, we're involved in a number of, uh, uh, a number of projects uh, where we're helping customers to solve some of those, uh, some of those problems uh, in, in what is a, uh, you know, been a challenging time over the last 12 months, obviously with COVID, but I think uh, e even without COVID, um, the ATM industry uh, is going through a number of changes to to meet changing consumer habits and changing banking habits. Uh, uh, and definitely the influence of uh, the digital channels, plus also new players into the market, such as fintechs, uh, is providing quite a quite a lot of disruption, which which obviously uh, traditional players in the market need to decide how they go about their strategy uh, and how they meet the challenges in the market. From my side, I think there's a lot to think about. It's an interesting um, it's an interesting subject, um, and hopefully one that we can uh, we can help uh, the the industry with and be part of uh, part of some of the solutions. Um, I just like to uh, once again uh, thank the thank the speakers for their time. Um, I found the uh, I, I found the time very interesting, and also uh, just to thank uh, everyone that joined the uh, uh, joined the meeting uh, and um, has participated. Um, thank you for your participation as well, and hopefully we'll uh, we'll speak to you all individually at some stage in the uh, in the not too uh, distant future. Um, thank you, everyone, and uh, keep safe. Thank you, Steve. So uh, just opening that back up to, to the floor. Um, uh, is, has anybody got any questions that they would like to ask? Uh, perhaps uh, putting Dion on the spot a little bit. Um, what, one of the interesting slides in uh, Steve Gilder's presentation from Paragon sort of talked about uh, some of the biggest challenges that organisations have been having uh, over, you know, over the last 12 months, and I guess as organisations move into this sort of more flexible working way, a lot more remote working that's going to be taking place, uh, that, that's obviously had a huge impact uh, on the testing side, as, as Steve talked about. But um, the, the second highest uh, area that, 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 that was uh, dealt with was to, to do with uh, planning delays, uh, and the third highest was uh, development and delivery delays. Um, you know, what are your thoughts, Dion, on, on that as to how organisations in, in the payment space can start to uh, really, really sort of tackle those, those particular parts of the, uh, like the, the, the traditional life cycle? Well, thank you, Norman. Um, it's, it's worthwhile just spending two minutes on that. Um, I'm quickly going to share a, a slide. Um, it might be useful. Hopefully, you can um, you can see that, Norman. Uh, yes, we can. Thank you. So, so you know, to, to, to Steve's earlier point around uh, the types of, of, of projects that we that we see, um, this this picture represents, I guess, a, a typical stanchion customer um, when it's a when it's a bank um, with lots of um, uh, disparate and separate uh, and independent systems um, that that uh, sit in the payments environment. Um, you'll see, for the sake of simplicity, we've just you know, drawn, drawn the uh, ATM channel and pass channel uh, on the left hand side. But there's there, there are quite a um, a lot of complexity uh, in this environment, and maybe it tags onto what I what I spoke about earlier as well in terms of the complexity of making sure all of this hangs together. Now, when Organizations try to embrace um, new opportunities, whether it's a new digital channel, 
um, whether it's uh, just operational uh, improvements when they try to, to innovate and support new payment types. Um, a lot of these systems that we see on the diagram here um, are based on, on uh, legacy technology or um, it's just very difficult to change and there's a lot of risk involved in, uh, in changing uh, some of these environments. So when Stantia comes along and, and, and wants to do, um, you know, wants to implement a new project, um, we've in the past always hit into uh, uh, an obstacle in terms of the complexity of changing some of these systems. So with our integration uh, experience, we've, we've, we've started building our own, uh, what we call a payment application server to put in the middle of, of this environment that gives us a platform from which we can innovate and add new functionality into um, an existing system, system in the in existing environment without um, all the costs and risk associated with changing what's already there. Um, so, you know, our, our whole idea is to put building blocks there that allows for reuse and allow us really to build um, uh, custom applications, um, well, I guess both custom applications for specific uh, 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 user needs or user requirements, but then also applications that we can reuse um, across um, uh, across the industry. Uh, and really our focus is just on doing things faster. We're trying to just uh, reduce the time to market. We're trying to make uh, uh, the addition of, of uh, digital channels specifically uh, cheaper. Um, and we're trying to help customers create an environment where they can easily uh, um, try new ideas, uh, innovate, uh, create um, MVPs, and so forth. So that was the, really the basis of, of the Virtual platform that we've, that we've created. And if you think about it in terms of um, just what, what the architecture looks like, we, we're trying to or what we have done is we've created um, lots of underlying building blocks that you need when you when you want to build um, payment rails. So whether it's um, you know the audits or the encryption part, um, the HSM integration that tags onto what uh, Roland spoke about, um, the notification that you would expect with um, with a payment application server. All of those building blocks we've created out of the box, and then what we do is we create applications on top of it. With specific use cases in mind. So I just want to give you a, a very quick sense of the types of applications that we've um, that we've built already. Let me just skip through this for the sake of time. Um, so this is just a, a, a subset of, of, of the use cases that we've already created on the uh, on the Virta platform. Uh, it includes uh, QR code acquiring. So um, what we've done there is um, allow um, the display of a QR code on a, a physical point of sale device, and we've done the integration into multiple backend um, wallet providers. And essentially, we've allowed um, the um, the bank to uh, to process QR payments without changing anything in their existing um, uh, payments environment or, or the existing transaction switch. Um, then the, the local scheme integration that we've done in the Middle East uh, is really once again creating um, new rails um, for, uh, uh, for multiple banks actually um, based on, um, you know, based on, 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 on um, uh, regulatory um, uh, developments there. Um, and then instant issuance, um, um, and I guess you'll, you'll be familiar with, with the concept. I specifically want to talk about the token lifecycle management as well. And um, we've seen in certain parts of the uh, the world, um, card digitization being a, um, um, a very um, flavor of the month at the moment, for lack of a better term. In some parts of the world, it's been done and dusted and the box has been ticked. But in other parts of the world, it's a real trend to, um, at the moment, uh, provide that capability um, to um, the issuers, uh, card holders. Um, and we've done the integration into both the MasterCard and Visa uh, services. Um, so that's um, that, that, that's quite a comprehensive application uh, that we've built. And then the the, uh, the last one that I specifically want to point out on this um, list is the notification management, where um, we're doing basic functionality like 
uh, notify the cardholder that the transaction was done um, on various different channels, uh, normally SMS, but it can be other channels as well. Um, but we also um, building in that application uh, at the moment actually is allowing cardholders to interact with um, their own accounts um, and set transaction limits on their accounts, um, set um, rules around where cards may be used and when they may, may be used. Um, so it's um, it's really a way, once again, to, 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 to go back to my original slide, a way of um, building around existing payment platforms and allowing very quick addition of functionality that either drive revenue or save costs or do both. Um, so, you know, we, we, we're quite excited about uh, where we're going with this um, solution, purely because we can see the value it unlocks um, and more importantly, the value that it unlocks quickly. Thank you, Dion. And, and of course, that, that's highly relevant for the modern consumer now. So, oh, oh, fantastic. OK, so our, our marketing team will will be in touch with you uh, fairly soon to thank you for um, the, the participation to share some content with you uh, from the from the speakers. Uh, we, we always value any feedback, so any feedback you do have would be uh, greatly appreciated. Uh, any topics that you'd like to know more about as well. Uh, and of course, uh, do reach out to your your local Stanchion representatives and teams. Uh, we would be delighted to have a one on one uh, on any topics. We appreciate that uh, not all questions that you want to ask uh, are relevant for the open forum. So we'd, we'd be very happy to have uh, one on one conversations uh, with any of our internal teams or indeed any of our ex external speakers. Uh, finally, I, I would like to thank uh, you for your participation uh, and also our speakers, uh, Steve Paragon. Uh, Roland from FutureX and Michael from uh, NCR and Andrew from Calio and Atmir Association for their input and uh, sparing their time to share their thoughts with you today. Thank you very much and wishing you a good rest of the day uh, wherever you may be. Thanks so much. Bye bye now. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks. Bye.